everyone. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest tonight is Dave Obelkovich. I heard about Dave through my personal trainer, Mark Heller. He said, email Dave and get him on the show. <laughs> so I did. I knew I reached the right party when Dave responded to call him. And by the way, if his wife, Lynn, answers, it's okay. She ran the New York City Marathon in 1981 and finished it in three hours and 55 minutes. <laughs> so you know Dave is a runner. But Dave actually owns a couple of interesting records. He owns, maybe tied, with the most consecutive New York City Marathon runs. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, let's get started because we got a lot to cover today. Yeah. A little bit about your background. Where were you born? A little bit about your family. Something about your schooling. Okay. I was born in Johnson City, New York, which is next to Binghamton. That's about halfway to Buffalo. And I have an older brother, Jim, who just got started running a few years ago. He's over 70 now, so it was a good influence on him. <laughs> you finally influenced Yeah, <laughs> finally, after all these years, yeah. So graduated from high school, and the same year I graduated from high school, my brother Jim graduated from Columbia. So I came to Columbia in 1961, and I've been in New York City ever since. So I started playing the violin when I was in third grade, because my father played a little bit, and my brother plays. So of course, I had to play the violin. And I was pretty good, played in an all-county high school, uh, um, orchestra in high school, and uh, came to Columbia, played in the Columbia University Orchestra for four years, and had a lot of fun playing. Then uh, for maybe 20 years or so, I just didn't play much. And one of my running friends about 15 years ago invited me to a concert in my neighborhood, the Riverside Orchestra. Mm -hmm. So I went and it was a wonderful concert. It was a cellist from the Philharmonic. So I asked the conductor if she could use another violinist. She said, we can always use another violinist. So for 15 years, I've been playing with them. And through them, I joined the amateur chamber music players, and now I play in quartets three or four times a week, and I really enjoy it. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Let's go back to your childhood. Were you very athletically inclined? Uh, I rode the bicycle, we played lots of games, and my last year in high school, I was intrigued by running, so they said, Dave, why don't you join the track team? So a typical workout was they'd give me a 10-second head start to go run around the track, and then they would all catch me. <laughs> I ran one race, I did a 100-yard dash, I came in next to last. That was not my sprint. I'd rather run 100 miles than 100 yards. <laughs> we got into that. Now, what did you study in, in school? Would you, would music uh, the, uh, your theme? Well, I started in astronomy and math, and when I didn't do all that well in the math classes, I was getting like Bs. And my chairman, who had a Nobel Prize, said, Mr. Obelkovich, maybe you should consider changing your major. <laughs> so since I had loved music ever since I was a kid, I changed to a music major my second year at Columbia. And then I got a master's degree in music and music education at Teachers College just across the way. And for almost 30 years was a teacher in New York City public schools and high schools. And the first year, I had a girl, Maisie Reed, who was a very advanced violin player. And at graduation, we played a concerto by Bach for piano and two violins. Uh -huh. and one of my colleagues played the piano. So that was, I think, the highlight of, in terms of music of my, of my high school career, to play graduation with Maisie. Great. What, yeah. Which high school was that? This was Benjamin Franklin High School. It's 116th and... Uh, FDR, I think it's a, a math and science high school now. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Lived on the Upper West Side, yeah. Always? Yeah. Always, yes. In fact, some people asked, you know, how did my marathon streak start? And I didn't have to travel 50 miles or didn't have to take two subways and four buses. Uh, <laughs> I could always walk home from the finish line. From the uh, New York City Marathon. New York City Marathon. So that okay. was one incentive to keep doing it. Interesting. <laughs> well, you have a phenomenal streak, 36 in a row. That's right. And in fact, you got a shirt that started a few years ago? Yes, my friend Tucker Anderson designed this shirt about four years ago for, for me and for him because we were the only two who had consecutive finishes every year since 1976. And on the back, he's got this no age limit, <laughs> which is very cute. <laughs> so there are two of you that have the, the well, streak. We did have the streak, and then 
four years ago, uh, Liz Robbins wrote a book, uh, A Race Like No Other, mm -hmm. and ch chapter 18 is about just the two of us. But a year or two after that, he fell in a, in a pothole while running a race a few weeks before the New York City Marathon. Uh, broke his, sh his shoulder and cut up his knee real bad. And the day before, he said, I can't run New York. It took me 15 minutes to go half a mile. So his streak stopped at, I think, 34. So now he started a new streak, and when he gets to be 100, he'll be up to 33, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, amazing. So I made a little chart, and if you come to visit me in the house, in the apartment, you'll see this on the door. <laughs> so all the doormen know it, and the people who clean the floors know about it. I did run six miles in 1973. The next year I finished, and that was the year more than 50% dropped out. It was a mid-September, it was a real hot day, and then it poured cats and dogs. Dave, and of Central course, in those, in those times, you ran entirely in Central Park. Uh, through 1975 was Central Park. 76 was the first five-borough marathon. Oh, and that's when your streak begins. So that's when my streak began. Interesting. Yeah. And Dave, I'm, I'm so yeah. fascinated by this. You recall, what was the pr entry price back in those days? Someone said it was $2, something like that. You don't remember, huh? I don't remember exactly. I do remember that for a few years, they had to sponsor Olympic Airways and the winner got tripped for two to, uh, to Greece. There was no, win no women the first year. Nina Cusick dropped out at 18 miles. 1870 was the first year. I, I didn't run it then. Okay, so when, when did the first women run it? I think it was the next year. 71, okay. But the first three years, a total of 12 women entered and six finished. In the last three years, about 45,000 women started and 44,900 finished. Oh, my God. That's probably a better percentage <laughs> than men. Much, much better, yes. Interesting. Yeah. Well, let's go back to your streak. So you started in 70, 1976. 76. The first one with the five barrel. Right. Three hours, 22 minutes. That's an excellent. So I probably qualified you for Boston. I don't remember. <laughs> but I do know that... In the early 80s, men under 40 had to run two hours, 50 minutes. Oh, my gosh. And I think that's one of the reasons, because now it's, what, 310 or something. It, it raised them, yeah. They, they, they changed it again, but it's still... Yeah. Like when I ran 240 in 1982, I was about top 4%. If I ran that time last year, I would have been top half a percent, <laughs> like eight times better. And I think one of the differences is that Boston is making it so much easier for men under 40 to get into, into the marathon. That's interesting. Yeah. So much more easier. Some people would say it's still tough. <laughs> well, 310 is a, is a world of difference between 250. Yeah, yeah. it is. It yeah. is. But a lot more runners are, be, are running the marathon nowadays. All the baby boomers, practically. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. yeah. They run a couple of days a week, and they lift weights, and they do bicycling, and so on. So they're, I'd say they're not serious runners. Like you had to be to run 250, uh, 50 well, minutes. To run under three hours is uh, is a, a phenomenal time, yeah. and takes us both serious and a talented runner. Yeah. Now in those 36 years, yeah, was there one or two where you said, "Boy, I don't know if I'm going to make it to the starting line." Well, I I always knew I'd get to the starting line, but in let's see, in 1974 when it was so hot. It was four loops of Central Park plus the lower loop. And I remember the last loop, there were only a few people with insight. And one was a 16-year-old girl. And she would beat me up the hill, but I would beat her down the hill. <laughs> I think I finally beat her by 10 seconds, something like that. <laughs> so uh, I, I always knew I would finish, even when one year I had a broken rib. I think I ran 408. 76. Yeah, that's the year, because the year before I broke in four hours. So uh, normally I would have broken four hours in, but that I had a broken, broken, broken rib. rib. Now, did the doctor say, uh, say, take it easy, or you s decided, let me get to the starting line and just mm. see how I feel? No. It hurt more to cough or to get out of bed. I had to kind of roll out from my side. I couldn't just jump out of bed. But uh, no, and then suddenly the day of the marathon, I could run under 10 minutes a mile, which was a, a breakthrough for me. So I was very happy with that race. It was raining really hard. My daughter was waiting for me, and I had already gone by. So also the days before cell phones. That's right, yeah. And then 529, I ran with my daughter Maria, and I said, I'll stay with you the whole way. And like 20 times, she said, Dave, I got to walk. That's OK. I'll walk. 
And then I had also run 506 with her a couple of years before that. 2010, I got a call from people who wanted to put me on the VIP bus. Uh, this was a week before the race. And I thought, well, that's great. So then I asked them, well, are you going to do the same for the woman with the longest streak? She's a friend of mine. And they said, no, tell us about her. So a day later, they called her, and she was on the same bus. So we were on the bus, and I had my running shoes with a chip on it in this plastic bag because it was raining that day. And I had a copy of the book. So I go into the bag, take out the book, show it to her, and put it back in. And now we get near the start. And everything's all set. You have tables with all kinds of food and all New York Times for everyone. I go in my bag, and I take out one shoe. <laughs> Fortunately, the shoe with the chip on it. Somewhere, I had lost my other running shoe with a brand new pair of shoes with new orthotics. So they couldn't find the bus. They couldn't find the bus driver. So plan C was to call my wife, Lynn. So she said, oh, I'm running in Central Park. And I said, well, when you get home, find another left shoe with a left orthotic and meet me. She took the subway to get to the seven-mile point. <laughs> <laughs> that was two years ago. So I ran with a street shoe on my left foot and the running shoe on my right foot. <laughs> and there's some pictures of that. And some of the runners were looking at me, and they say, so what is that? And I figure humor is the best way. I said, oh, haven't you heard? It's the latest running style. <laughs> So I lost about three minutes that year. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. And your crew, your wife was dead to <laughs> bail you out. She bailed me out. Right? That's interesting. <laughs> but talking about shoes, over the years, what is your opinion in the change in shoes? I mean, they've gone from probably from very minimal to over-engineered, these yeah. thick heels, and now natural running or barefoot running. Yeah, where the they're brain. landing on the front of the foot. Well, since I have orthotics, I need something where there's room for the orthotics. So usually I run in Sauconies. That seems to work well with that. And a lot of people now are landing on the front part of their foot. And I look at photographs of marathoners, quarter milers, milers, and they're all landing on their heel. And that's good enough for me. <laughs> if it's good enough for the pros, it's good enough for me. We're all an experiment of one. Yeah. But uh, the Born to Run book has uh, changed a lot of, opened up a lot of people's eyes. Yeah. Or there's, yeah. uh, there's other ways of running. There are, that's true. Yeah. And okay. running backwards is a help too sometimes if you're injured. Right? Running backwards. <laughs> uh, do you do any uh, cross training like swimming or biking? Let's see, 1989, my wife bicycled almost to the Canadian border in three days. So the next day, I put my bike in the car, drove up to meet her. We did some cycling, and Sunday, we're driving back to the city. It's a long ways. And she said, Dave, my real dream is to go to California. And that's what we did the summer of 1990, 4,000 miles in eight weeks. You biked? Just the two of us. Yeah. That's Trip amazing. of a lifetime. That's amazing. Trip of a lifetime. We discovered the Southwest, so now we go to New Mexico every summer. Now, when did you discover your talent and love for ultra marathon? Well, I used to live in the Majestic, and in, I think in 76, I looked out the window. It was a Saturday morning, and the races were never on Saturday morning. I looked at the schedule, and it says 50K. So I went out and ran one loop with some of the people, and I thought, wow, this is really great. So the next year, I entered a 50K. This so, is in New York? Yeah, in Central Park. This is the Knickerbocker, maybe? No, Knickerbocker is a 60K. That's true. And that's in after the marathon. Well, nowadays it yeah, is. Yeah, it used to be in November. Sometimes it was in early March. They've changed it around. I think they don't do the 50K anymore. Okay. But I realized that I don't have a lot of speed, but I have pretty good endurance. So since then, I've done like a, almost 190 ultra marathons. <laughs> Dave, are you yes. a member of the Marathon Maniacs? No, I'm not. I've met some of them. I'm an honorary member in Japan. They, they, they have a 100 marathon club. And I said, well, I only have 88 marathons, but I run 170 ultra marathons. They said, we'll make that you counts. a member. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've met some of these marathon maniacs, and some of them, I think, are really crazy. Some of them are nice people. But I think, uh, I think it's not for me. <laughs> you don't want to be lumped into the crazies. No, no, I don't want to be lumped into the crazy. But my all-time favorite ultra ah. is the Comrades Marathon, which started in 1921. It's by far the oldest in the world. And here, if we get 1,000 runners, like a JFK 50-mile race, they say the biggest race in the, in the country at an ultra. 
There they get 15,000. But 16, from all over 000, the world. All over the world. And how many of those have you done? So I've done 11. I think the th third one was in 2004. It's usually early June. A few years ago when they had the, the World Cup, they put it in May because they didn't want anything interfering with, with, the, the, with the Comrades Marathon. Why is that a, a favorite? A uh, favorite because I have some pictures from it. <laughs> <laughs> so this was at about halfway. I was running with a woman from Switzerland who unfortunately was much too fast for me, but we did run a little ways together. And at about halfway, I met my friend, my new friend from Cape Town. She, she was an officer in this Run Walk for Life group. They go into every big company and they say, okay, if you walk five minutes a day, you're in this room. You walk 10 minutes a day, you're over here. And I, so then they gradually get faster and longer. I said, how many do in the marathon? She said, oh, uh, comrades, oh, 150. Wow. So, so we ran together for five hours. And then at the finish line, just before the finish line, I met my friend Mayumi from Japan. She was 63 then. I thought she was like 53. So the three of us were holding hands. Unfortunately, the other woman is, is off. Is over the there on the side. Yeah, so, but, but after oh, the finish, this beautiful. is what we look like. So we've been running 55 miles in over 10 hours. And you see, we're not staggering. We're not falling over. We're so happy you guys we finished. look refreshed, <laughs> ready for a little breakfast. Yeah. yeah. So, so you meet these people as you run and make friends. Yes. Yeah, so what I do, I carry two or three business cards, like in my cap. And if I run with someone, they say, well, how can I get in touch? Well, here's my email address. <laughs> and I met some wonderful, wonderful people that way. So this is from 2008. Uh, if you pay like $20 or so, you can get a book with photographs largely of you. It also has, this is one of the women who won. There's their twins, Nergalyeva twins, who are like 30. And they're not slender. They're kind of stocky, but they're very fast. But did they won the... Uh, they've, won, they've usually won. They come first, they second, come in third. First, in first women's second, division. third, yeah. And this is me running with my friend Jane Sturziker from Australia. She's what they call a Spartan. She's finished every Melbourne Marathon in like 34 years now. And there are only about 10 of them now. Spartan. So it has to do with the number of... Yeah, if you finished every single marathon that Melbourne has had, you're called a Spartan. Oh, and there, my there are only goodness. 10 of I, them I call left. it amazing. <laughs> a Spartan. Yeah. So this was Longevity. one of my slower times, 11 hours, 38 minutes. That was your slowest Whoops. time? Yeah, there's a 12-hour time limit now used to be 11 hours. And this was me wearing my Milrose shirt. And I don't have, the, you can't see my comrade's shorts. <laughs> <in there. laughs> Milrose. Yeah, so when you ran it in, uh, in Central Park, you ran for the Milrose teams? I ran for the Milrose team. This, this year, I didn't, because this, this has pockets. So I <laughs> wanted to wear something with pockets. This is 2009. 2009. Yeah, so we have the same number. And once you get a green number, this the running number that they give you is yours for life. There was only one exception to that. One guy had finished it like 30 years, 30 times, so he has a green number. And when he died, his son said, I want my dad's number. <laughs> so they made an exception and they gave it to him. To him. So, so to get the green, you have to run how many? You have to finish 10. Do I have to be consecutive? No, 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 just 10. And, just ten. So this is my permanent number, 48,500. And the G, of course, stands for green. If someone has nine finishes, the next year, they're going for their 10th. So the, if someone has a yellow background, they tell you, you stay with them because no matter what happens, they're going to finish. They want that green number. Right, so that's... Broken rib over the <laughs> <artist>. <laughs> Right. 2011 was when I got my green number. And in this souvenir brochure, as they say, they had an entire paragraph about me. And I mentioned my running streak at New York City Marathon. Unfortunately, I was not the first American to get. It was a guy from Brazil, which is South American, beat me by two hours. <laughs> but wow. I'm the first North American to wow. get a green number, and I'm very proud of that. This is what it looks like. And I asked, well, when will I get it? And they say, as soon as you finish, there'll be someone from the green number club. There are like 10,000 members, and they'll pull you aside Excellent. into the green number tent. Excellent. And this is like 10 seconds later. So I got the green later. number. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're intended to Conrad's as long as you can? Yes, I'm taking the vice of uh, Toshiko D'Elia, 
who's the first woman over 50 to run under three hours in a marathon. She's like 85 now. And she said, Dave, keep doing that as long as you can. Well, this year I'll be 69 in just a few weeks. Mm -hmm. So next year when I do comrades, I'll be 69. And I think when you're over 70, it doesn't get easier to run. A few <laughs> years ago, I ran with a guy who was like 74. Yeah. And we were at halfway. He's got a big smile. He didn't finish. <laughs> so uh, He may have started too fast. May, he, well, we were running together, and he looked very strong. Very then, strong, but, but 74. He, I don't know what happened. For 56 then. miles. Yeah, 56 uh, that's miles. A, <laughs> Two marathons that's plus. That is amazing. Since you played music, yeah. you're going to be honoring us with your friend, I think, Susan? Susan, yes. Are going to play together. Tell us about what you're going to be playing. This is a, a duo written by Mozart. He wrote two of them when he was, I guess, in his early 30s. And I just learned this morning from one of my friends at the 92nd Street Y that the brother of Joseph Haydn had got a, a commission to write some duos. And he realized he was not such a good composer, so he paid Mozart to write them for him. Uh -huh. <laughs> and this is the first movement of one of them. Uh, it's Kirkle 420, 423. The other one is 424. This one's a little bit easier. So on that note, we'll take a break. On that note, right, okay. And then uh, we'll hear you play. You okay. listen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for right. coming in. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it, but now I've got to run. <clears throat>